Annyeong! Welcome to Delightful! This is my first project coming back to work after my maternity leave, so did I go easy on myself? Just to face up, maybe? Nope! We're reworking a doll from head to toe, as usual! But in all seriousness, our start to parenthood has been great. I've enjoyed every second of it. But, workaholic that I am, I'm also excited to start a fresh project. This is one that's been several years coming, believe it or not. Where to start? Uh, I love norige. Norige are a traditional Korean accessory that comes in a variety of beautiful and intricate forms. In the ye olden times of the Joseon dynasty, they served practical purposes such as carrying ear and toothpicks, uh, needle pouches for sewing, and the most popular of all, ones that carried fragrances. But they've always been decorative. Nowadays, people still wear them for any fancy occasion that might require you to dress in the traditional hanbok, but they show up in more casual places too. For example, my in-laws use them as keychains for their wardrobes. I'll admit I may have a little collection of my own. Only time will tell how out of control this gets. So, I've mused over the idea of making a Korean doll with norige hair for a long time. I've made drawings and sketches of norige haired girls time and time again, but none of these ever manifested into dolls. Until now. Inspired by pop group Blackpink's sassy modern handbox and my favorite character concept artist Kim Hyung Tae, I brainstormed up a couple modern hanbok designs with fantasy elements. If I could only duplicate myself, I'd make all of these into dolls. <laughs> but for now, I chose to make this one. I'll be using a Draculaura doll from Monster High as my base. Bring her in! I got this one in a used toy lot off of eBay, so she's not in the best shape. But that's how I like him. There's nothing more satisfying than transforming potential landfill into an artistic vision. To the work table! First, use acetone to wipe off the factory face paint. Dab some on a tissue and give the face a nice long soak for starters. You can wipe most of it off this way. Finish removing the paint with Q-tips. Heat up the head until it's squishy enough to pop off the neck peg without much damage. You don't want to twist or stretch that funny shaped bit of plastic inside or the head might be loose when you stick it back on. Keep the hair dryer handy to heat up the head as needed and scrape out the stubbly hair plugs. They're chained together on the inside so you can usually pull out rows at a time. Voila! A perfectly cleaned up Draculaura head! Upon closer inspection, this doll has some damage. There are cuts and scrapes on the forehead, cheek, and the tip of the nose. That's unfortunate, but I'll carry on nonetheless. In retrospect, I might should have tried to sand them down or something. Give the doll a wash with warm soapy water to remove any leftover acetone and oils from your hands. Alright, let's give this doll fresh hair. Funny enough, I'm going with black, which was the doll's original hair color. If only I'd started with a normal Draculaura, I wouldn't have to do this step. Pluck out and peel away a couple hairs from the hank. Fold them in half over your nail. And slide it into your reroute tool, which is just a needle eye cut at an angle which is inserted into a drill chuck. Then stab it into the temples. I like to work my way around the hairline first. I want my doll to have two buns, so the existing center part works for my purposes. Once that's done, I fill in the rest. Because I know what hairstyle I want the doll to have, and I know nylon doll hair can get very voluminous very fast, I intentionally fill in the remaining hemispheres with little to no hair. It looks sparse when viewed directly, but when styled the amount of hair should turn out just right. Coat all those plugs on the inside with glue to ensure they don't tug loose. I pour some in through the neck hole and work it around with my fingers, trying to ensure glue touches all the hair, particularly around the part and hairline. Let that dry overnight, and when you come back, the hair should be connected nice and sturdy. Using a strip of fabric, twist ties, and pins, bundle the hair back and out of the way for the next step, drawing the face. Use our old friend Mr. Superclear to prep the surface. 
Spray in a ventilated area and wear your filtration mask to stay safe. All right, let's go. So given that her outfit is quite elaborate, I figured a simple face up will complement her design. I begin with a timid light brown watercolor pencil to place my rough sketch. Once I'm confident with that, I add blush to the cheeks, nose, and lips. Draculara is a very pink base doll, so to edge her towards a more East Asian skin tone, I add a fair amount of yellow and orange to the blush, instead of using straight up red like I usually do. I also blush the eyebrows. Use black pastel to form a soft, smooth gradient, then come back with a kneaded eraser to shave off the excess and carve the shape. Now sharpen that black pencil to the finest point possible and sketch in some hairs. Feeling confident with my rough sketch, I then dive in with black. Yes, straight to black. A little risky, I know. <laughs> I switch to pinks and browns to soften the effect and add a subtle degree of shading. She's going to have dark eyes with gray as the highlight color. I add more obvious gray shadows to the eye whites this time as well. I feel like I have a tendency to make the square as much too white, like a solid white that really pops, so I figured I'd go for a softer and less cartoonish approach this time. Speaking of tendencies, I also have a bad habit of drawing a thick lower lid line. It's not intentional, I'm just a bit heavy handed. <laughs> So I use the sharp edge of a fresh eraser to pull those back a bit. Looks much more delicate, don't you agree? Wow, I got remarkably far on the first layer of sealant, but it's time to add another one. Spray the doll again and wait for it to dry before you continue. Think of it as making a new layer in Photoshop. From here on out, I repeat the same steps. The blush and watercolor pencil becomes more opaque and solid with each pass. Alright, now for fine details. I'll be using gouache paints for this part. Zoom in, hold your breath, and dab in a teeny tiny highlight around the pupil. Okay, now I know I wanted to keep it simple, but not too simple. What say we add sparkle eyeshadow? You can't say no to that. Lastly, red Pikachu cheeks, because I love these things! Alright, they're not actually Pikachu cheeks. They represent youth and purity and are worn by brides. I just can't resist face dots, apparently. They make great design elements! After the final spray of Mr. Super Clear sealant, we can take out the pins and release her from the hair mask. Hold on, this has never happened before. It rusted? Oh dear. The glue must not have been dry yet. Well, it is monsoon season, it's been raining non-stop, so I should have given it longer to dry, I guess. It yanked out some hair plugs and got rust on her skin, but I think we can repair her. Just shove them back in there. Now we can style her hair. Say it with me now. Shove that head on a pike. Use a skewer or needle to divide the hair at the part. Tie it off to keep it from bouncing back. Then pour boiling water over the doll to set the hair. I try not to get any water on the face, but it always happens, and every time I'm amazed that the face survives the process. <laughs> With the hair tamed, we can take it off the styling stand, reheat the neck hole, and reunite the head with the body. Squeeze the temples and gently twist the head back on to avoid distortion. There's not really a wrong or right time to put the head back on the body, just as long as you're done with the reroute and don't need access through the neck hole anymore. Okay, now to give her buns. Just comb and wrangle the hair in place. I said wrangle the hair in place. Ah, uh, this is impossible. Come here. Sometimes you just gotta pinch the doll between your knees to get the job done. There we go. Wrap them up and around several times. The twist in the hair will help form the shape. This is exactly how I do space buns on myself. <laughs> to end a space bun, you normally tuck the end underneath and secure it with a bobby pin, but doll hair is much too thick for that. 
And I don't have doll-sized bobby pins. Using another elastic, I secure the swirl tightly in place, then to keep it from unspinning, I literally stab a sewing pin into the head. And it worked! It does leave a tail, though. What should I do about that? Cut it really short, or leave it? I never quite resolve this issue, but the Norige should cover that up for the most part. The best way to get realistic buns on dolls is to use yarn hair. Mozekito has the exact tutorial for that. But I've got so much nylon doll hair, you guys, I gotta use this stuff up. Oh, and if you're thinking that these buns are kinda big, you're not wrong. <laughs> They're huge on purpose to be reminiscent of actual traditional hairstyles. Let's just say you haven't seen impressive headwear until you've delved into the Joseon Dynasty style. This guy's hat's my favorite. Now, how to attach the norige. I cut off the top and seal the end right at the knot. Then, you guessed it, we're going to pin it in place. They're so colorful and cute, I think the pin's head actually adds to the design so I don't mind it showing. Oh my gosh, I love her so much already! Ah, oh, okay, it's time for that ridiculous handbook. With the concept art at my side and a couple Google searches for actual handbook patterns later, I came up with some rough sketches for a pattern. I'll be using these drapey chiffon fabrics to approximate handbok silks. I wish I had the exact same colors as the ones present in the norige, my yellow and blue fabrics aren't quite as vibrant or saturated, but it's close enough that I hope it looks okay. Let me tell you, this marked the beginning of a long and arduous journey. Anyone who's tried to make a pattern from scratch knows that you draw up your best guess and cut out the pieces, only to have the first prototype fail spectacularly. Honestly, I don't even know why I shot this early footage, it's not helping anyone. These pieces look nothing like what I end up using by the third and fourth iterations. Most of you watch for entertainment, but for that one person out there who actually does want to recreate this, here's what I end up using for the final version. It's by no means a polished pattern, which is why I'm giving it out here for free instead of putting it on my Etsy shop. But hopefully it'll help. Good luck! show you how I handle some of the unusual parts of the costume though, like the pleats. I fold the fabric in half and iron it. Then I take a ruler and mark 2.5 centimeter segments all the way down. Fold the fabric over and line up the marks, then pin that pleat in place. This is where the transparency of the fabric really comes in handy, because you can see exactly how big the pleat before it was. Sew all the pleats down, remove the pins, and iron it flat. Aren't they cute? I love pleats. As for the decorative elements of her handbok, represented by these squiggles here, I sketched up a long vertical panel featuring traditional themes, then colored it digitally in Photoshop. Lucky for me, I have a Chinese friend who I could run the hanja by, so she helped me double check for accuracy. I want this decal on the front of the joguri to say delightful, and she helped me get it close. Thanks, Ting Ting! Once the designs are good, I print them out. Along with some other stuff, because I didn't want to waste a piece of paper. <laughs> Following the instructions on the package, I carefully iron on the decals one at a time. Ah, oh, shoot, I think the iron was too hot. This brand is more sensitive than the kind I used previously for things like Phoenix's wings. The fabric transfer turned out... Mm, okay. A little warped, maybe, but hopefully they'll layer up nicely and no one will notice? As for the more delicate designs, like the sleeves, I simply painted the designs on in white, then pale yellow, and finally gold on top. She's got knots hanging from her skirt as well, to echo the knots in the norige. I chose to make a simple button knot for each of these. There's a book I recommend if you're interested in knotting. I got really into it one summer, and now I can do this one in my sleep. Here, let me show you. Make two loops around your pointer and thumb. 
Fold B over the top of A. Take A and thread it through like this. Continue around with A and bring it through the center. Then do the same with B. It takes a bit of tugging and jostling to get the knot to settle into place, but once you do, it should look like this. How nice! I make four of these. And lastly, my favorite accessory, the jokturi. I make a loop of ribbon and sew it in place. Insert a second loop, stuff it with some fluff. Then tuck in the ends. I use embroidery thread and beads to make the tassels. String four beads onto your thread, then run it back the other way. Tuck a thicker clump of embroidery threads into the loop and pull tight. Tie the ends. Smoosh glue down onto the ends to shape them into a broad, flat surface, then wait for it to dry. Cut off the excess, and now you have a tiny, perfect tassel. Aren't they cute? So small. Sew these into the bottom edge of the jokturi. Just like the norige, it will stay in place with the help of yet another handy dandy pin. Whew, I've been at this for a while now. Making this elaborate hanbok is time consuming. Whenever I'm deep into a project, my workroom always explodes into chaos. It's a mess of fabric trimmings and patterns everywhere. But it's worth the mess. Here are all the finished parts. We've got a tool petticoat to help the first massive skirt keep its shape. Skirt 1, which ties around the waist. Skirt 2, which goes over the shoulders and snaps in the back. Skirt 3, which wraps around the whole ensemble and ties at the bust line. The joguri, of course, which I'm quite proud of. the jokturi, the norige, and these precious little socks, which I bought at the same shop as the norige. You'll never see them under the outfit, but aren't they so cute? And the perfect size for Monster High dolls, no less. Although it's not perfect, and there are parts of the outfit I wish I'd gone better, <laughs> fabric transfers, I'm still pleased with how it turned out. I've been working on this for so long, I was starting to hate it, you know how that goes? But my hubby reassured me that I'd just been looking at it for too long, and that it was good, actually. I hope he's right. Let's dress her up! I've just been calling her Norige Girl, but I suppose she needs a name, doesn't she? Well, seeing that the Korean holiday Chuseok is this weekend, let's name her Songpyeon. <laughs> Songpyeon is a kind of rice cake people make for the harvest celebration, so her name is basically rice cake. <laughs> so cute! I wanted a lavish layer upon layer of beautiful fabric design, and I think she comes across that way. There are also just enough traditional elements to identify her outfit as a hanbok, but it's clearly fantasy. As usual, I'm aiming for that over-the-top game art aesthetic. As mentioned earlier, I'm not thrilled about the ends of her hair sticking out like that under the buns. 
I think this is one of those view from the front only kind of dolls, you know? Her back will definitely be to the wall when I display her. Thank you so much for joining me! I hope you love Songpyeon as much as I do. I've wanted to make something like this for so long. And to be honest, I could totally make more. <laughs> Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe so that you never miss a custom doll. Catch you in the next video! Stay artsy! Annyeong!